Any list you look up on the topic will agree. Vince Young is one of the greatest college quarterbacks we've ever seen. He was the first D1 1A player to pass for 3,000 yards and rush for 1,000 yards in the same season. It wasn't until his junior year after he bid Coach Mack Brown to quote, let Vince be Vince that we got our true introduction to Vince Young the player. But Vince Young the person, for a lot of people, they still haven't really gotten that formal intro. As a kid, he lived through things that would boggle the mind. No father figure and a mother who's sober and doing well today, but in his youth struggled mightily with heavy addiction. Before he even hit high school, his home had been shot up, he'd been in handcuffs and exposed to heavy drug use. But through many unexpected blessings and a crazy chance encounter, he made it out of that life and into a better one. In college, he got a different view of life and lived it at the highest level, but afterwards would plummet back towards the life he lived prior. This is part one of the mostly tragic story of one of the greatest college football players ever, Q to Wayne. Yeah, I'm not no quitter, cause I'm a go, I'm a go, I'm a go getter. It's often said that even the most majestic tree first starts out as just a little sprout. But it's less commonly noted that when viewed by an insect, the little sprout was majestic in its own right. This is a cool quote by writer Scott Meyer, and I'll be using it as a theme throughout today's video. Unfortunately, Vince Young's story starts off as a familiar one. He had to grow up with no money and worse, no father. So his mom raised Vince and his two older sisters in Houston, Texas in the 1980s. Their circumstances weren't ideal with his dad not being around, but they were made so much worse by one other factor. We sometimes forget that parents are people too, and oftentimes, they're dealing with demons of their own. Due to the stresses of life, Vince Young's mom fell into alcohol abuse and heavy drug addiction. A lot of times she'd go out at night, but sometimes she'd bring the party to her home after the kids were asleep. Little did she know that Vince would be woken up by the noise, and he'd sneak and peek out to see what was going on in the living room. There he'd see things that no kids prepared to comprehend. Sex, drugs, drinking, arguments, fights. When he grew tired of all this forbidden viewing, dude would climb out of his bedroom window in search of some solace. Right outside his window was one of those majestic trees, and this sprout would climb the tree to see what life was like up there. Away from the drugs, away from the noise, a place far above it all where a kid could dream. I mean, if this magical tree had sprouted up here, maybe one day Vince could do so as well. It would be a challenge, not only for the obvious reasons that only 1% of football players make it to the NFL. But then you have outside influences, treacherous daily life, in a place where one bad day could stop a dream in his tracks. Vince got his first exposure to this through his sister's boyfriend in a tragic story he tells in his Players' Tribune letter. I'm 10 or 11 years old. Somebody banging on our front door. I'm talking about banging. My mama opened the door and the guy falls right into our living room, bleeding to death, shot four or five times, blood everywhere. It was my sister's boyfriend, regular everyday life. After that, Vince started sleeping by the front door for a while. That way, if anybody came, he could protect his mom, protect his sisters, protect his grandma. Mind you, he's 10 or 11 years old at this point. How much could he really do? Who knows? But he was prepared to do the absolute most he could, because if he didn't do it, who the hell would? Once again, his father was not in the picture. This is the position absent fathers put their sons in, and I'm talking specifically to voluntarily absent fathers. Some moms get bitter and want to try to use the kid to punish the dad, not realizing they're punishing the kid as well. But even if it's hard, if you got an opportunity to be in your kid's life, you need to try to make that happen. Because if not, you force them to be the man of the house way before they're even close to ready. At this point in his life, Vince should have been focused on being a kid and slowly developing into a man. But he was forced to skip all that training and start the job too soon, which is a great way to stun a kid's development. Vince saw even more atrocities in that house. A year or two after that last story, he tells another one. My uncle was strung out too. I'm 12 years old. He stole something from somebody and they start chasing after him, shooting. So where does he think to run? He runs into our house. What do they do? They start shooting rounds into the house. I'm peeking out the window of my bedroom and the dudes are standing right in our front yard. I remember thinking, maybe if I go out there and let them get me first, maybe my sisters can get away. They ran out of bullets, I guess. You know what I'm saying? They left. 
You really don't have time to think when it's going down. You're just a kid. You're in shock. Then it's over. And you don't ask why. Ain't nobody to ask but God. Vince spent his free time glued to the TV, watching the likes of quarterbacks like Warren Moon. His hometown Houston Oilers would end up meaning way more to Vince than he ever could have imagined. He didn't know it at the time, but watching that TV with aluminum foil antennas transfixed on number one, this act would set off sparks in the universe, forming a lifelong connection that could never be broken. With his dad not around, Vince needed to get a job early, so why not get one at the legendary Houston Astrodome? He was working at the rodeo, which is huge here in Houston, which was held in a section of the Astrodome. Because of that, Vince knew the side doors. He knew the back doors, every entrance and exit throughout the building. And the Astrodome was also home of the Houston Oilers. So one Sunday, Vince got an idea. Vince and his boys slid through a couple side doors, ducked, dodged, and snuck into the game. So they spent the whole day playing hide and seek with security. Now at this point in time, Vince was around 12 years old and quarterback Warren Moon had been traded to the Vikings. This was an early introduction for Vince to the cold, cold business of the NFL. But fortunately, by the time Vince decided to sneak in, the Oilers had drafted one hell of a replacement. Steve McNair had won Swag Offensive Player of the Year every year of his four year college career. The school he attended was an HBCU. It was none other than Alcorn State University. I actually grew up less than a mile away from that campus. I learned how to shoot pool there. I played basketball there. A large portion of my family went to school there. And let me tell you, as a kid, based on the amount of bumper stickers, t-shirts, and signs, and the way he was spoken of, this is a true story. I truly believe that Air McNair and Air Jordan were on the same level. It's kind of one of those moments where you had to be there. If you weren't, you probably can't comprehend what a star he was to us. So I just put it like this. He finished third in the Heisman voting at an HBCU in 1994. Anyway, by 1995-96, Steve McNair was playing for the Houston Oilers. And a young Vince Young got to watch him work up close and personal. He was glaring into his future. The seeds of a black quarterback making it in the NFL was planted in Vince's mind by Warren Moon. But seeing Steve McNair in person fertilized that seed at warp speed. And Vince found a drive that he'd never had before. So instead of the little sprout withering away due to the environment, his roots got stronger, he adapted, and he started to grow. Now, if you remember the quote from the beginning of the video, it says that when viewed by an insect, even the sprout looked majestic. Well, Vince was at that stage of his growth at this point, when people around him were starting to notice his magic. It got to the point that when he was around bad situations, people would tell Vince to go home, let them take care of it. It was their way of looking out and trying to keep him out of trouble so that one day he could reach his full potential. But he couldn't stay out of everything, including an all-out brawl that took place at his middle school. He says everybody was fighting. The boys, the girls, security guards, and teachers throwing punches out of fear. The boys was turning over vending machines, pulling fire alarms. Or maybe that was the teacher whose dress they set on fire. The story says she was running down the hall, bro, screaming in fear, looking for the fire extinguisher. Time for a new career. The police showed up and handcuffed Vince and some other kids. Fortunately for him, when his mom showed up, the police agreed to let her deal with Vince and he didn't go to jail. When Vince's mom came to get him, bro, she led him to him good. Despite the demons she was dealing with, she was still mom. Her words hit Vince hard as he saw how much it hurt her. That's when he started to get his mind right, more fertilizer. Vince leaned even harder into the football field and he still didn't have that strong male presence in his life, but at 16 years old, that was about to change. And it was about to change in the craziest way. A family member rented a van and drove Vince to Mississippi so that he could participate in a camp by his idol, Steve McNair. Then, when Vince got his chance to speak to Steve, he got his attention by telling him he was at the first game Steve had ever played at the Astrodome. He then told him the full story of how he'd snuck in and ran from security the whole time and Steve was amused and impressed. Vince had a natural charisma, important for a quarterback, and Steve McNair saw it firsthand on the first day he met him. Then he saw Vince perform on the field as Vince turned around and won MVP of the camp. Then Steve McNair, his football hero, took Vince under his wing and mentored the kid. He became the first father figure Vince 
ever had as that connection to the Oilers slash Titans organization got stronger. Vince even started calling Steve McNair Pops and Steve would call him his son. It was really a perfect fit. After that, anytime Vince had an issue, he would call the MVP who would answer day or night. Imagine not having a dad throughout most of your life. You ride six hours to a football camp and next thing you know, your hero accepts you as his son. Back in Houston, the two would hang out when Steve was on off season. He'd take Vince to the mall, let him shop a little bit. Before doing this, I didn't even realize their relationship was this deep. But check out this quick snippet from Vince's Players Tribune letter. In the offseason, whenever he was in town, I was like his designated credit card swiper. At the mall, at the restaurant, at events, it was always, quote, Get a bill to my son. Oh, you want some shoes? You want a fresh t-shirt? Go talk to my son. I was like his right hand and Steve took care of everybody, man. I got to see what he was living. I got a front row seat to a different life. Literally, front seat. 17 years old, I'm driving this man's Bentley around downtown Houston. Steve passed out in the passenger seat sleep. I was basically uber black before uber black. I mean, bro, picture me. I'm from the 4700 block, Tidewater Drive, the TWT driving the Benny. I'm rolling the windows down like, y'all see me, baby? Honestly, it still doesn't feel real to me. Do you understand how much that meant to me? Not driving the Bentley. I mean, yeah, that was cool. But what meant the world to me was this NFL legend, this MVP, this good man calling me son as the connection deepened this would allow vince to see beyond his glass ceiling and grow into the majestic tree that he'd only dreamed of becoming a good man who yes had his flaws as well took vince under his wing and asked for nothing in return that concept was so foreign vince could hardly believe it he was a guy who had everything owed him nothing yet was willing to share with him and play a role in his life a role that had previously gone uncasted and this was a dream casting the perfect person for the perfect role vince was just hoping that nobody would ever yell cut by his senior year in high school vince didn't have to sneak around in the houston astrodome like he'd done years before he was now out on the field in front of 45,000 in the 5a playoffs and my dude went off 400 plus yards of total offense and five touchdowns as he led his team to a 61-58 victory. He led his team to another win in the quarterfinals, but lost in the state semis despite a 500 yard, five touchdown day. Vince Young was named National Player of the Year, stacking 3,800 yards and 59 touchdowns as a senior quarterback for the Madison Marlins. High school ball was an escape for Vince Young. When he got home, he count down to the next time he was on the field. At times, his neighborhood can be a war zone, but the field was a playground. And while I understand that it's a dangerous game, for him, it was the only place where he could really be a kid. Vince was a five-star recruit and the number one prospect in the 2002 football recruiting class. He could have gone to really any school he chose, but if you know anything about Vince Young at all, you know exactly which school he picked. This was the pinnacle of Vince Young's career at the University of Texas, but this is how it actually started. He sat behind Chance Mock to begin his college career, but midway through that season, they was already splitting time. By 2004, as a red shirt sophomore, Vince entered the season as QB1 and would start every game. He led the team to an 11-1 record and their first ever appearance in the Rose Bowl, which they won. By 2005, Vince was a household name throughout much of Texas, which was crazy to him. But by the end of that year, his branches would stretch so much further and reach much wider. While they won their first Rose Bowl in 2004, Texas ain't go undefeated, they went 11-1. They beat everybody they played except Oklahoma, who smacked them in the face 12 to nothing. The story goes that after that game, Vince broke into tears and begged Coach Mac Brown to let Vince be Vince, both on the field and in the locker room. And Mac Brown was convinced they changed the offense. They transitioned into a shotgun zone read type offense similar to the one that Vince had run in high school. That was after the fifth game of Vince Young's sophomore season. And after that, he never lost another college game again. Texas came into the 05 season ranked number two and would maintain that ranking throughout the season. The team they could never overtake came in as number one and they went undefeated as well through regular season play. Bro, that USC team was being discussed as possibly 
the greatest college football team to ever be assembled. By the end of the year, they had two Heisman winners, a ton of NFL talent, and a legendary coach. Going into the national championship, they seemed to have it all, but they didn't have Vince Young. USC had two Heisman winners, and rightfully so. Vince happened to have his year during a season where Reggie Bush captured the imagination of the collective masses with his fluid running style. Vince would finish second in the Heisman voting, which some people did deem at the time as controversial. Of course, down the line, the NCAA would take Reggie's Heisman, and they tried to offer it to Vince, but he turned it down. And I'm glad he did because don't nobody want to get the award like that. You didn't vote for me, so that's Reggie's trophy. And yeah, Reggie took the Heisman, but there was another trophy on the line. And your boy Vince Young walked away with that one. In one of the greatest national championship games ever played, Vince went for 467 total yards, scored three touchdowns, including the go-ahead score with only seconds left in the fourth quarter. This was Vince's greatest moment his crowning achievement, his magnum opus, his growth was complete. His quote-unquote pops, Steve McNair, walked down to the field to tell his son how proud he was. Vince wanted to bottle this moment and cherish it forever, to go out that night and celebrate till the morning. His adrenaline was high. He could run through a wall. But about an hour later, he was back at the hotel, sleep. But the next day, he woke up to an absolute whirlwind. Bro, millions had gathered around the now majestic tree. Just a few years earlier, he was a feeble little sprout. And now all of these people was gawking at him. And not just any people. Tiger Woods, Derek Jeter, even Michael Jordan telling him how great his performance was. Every one of them had been at the game. And he was now sitting next to them in a VIP lounge. MJ cut the congrats short to try to pressure young Vince into signing with Jordan Brand, which is the most Jordan thing ever. Vince didn't know it at the the time he was just basking in the moment but this would soon become the norm the nfl was all business vince talks about college like it was a great time for him because it was think of the environment he came out of at texas there's no one running through his door with bullet wounds nobody shooting at his dorm room he could focus on ball so the so-called pressure just never got to him because vince young was having the time of his life and some of the things that a lot of the players may have taken for granted for Vince was basically a little slice of heaven. All the free food he wanted, a safe place to sleep at night, and just chilling with his boys who shared the same love for the game he did. The night before the national championship, this man was up late watching Looney Tunes and eating cereal, chilling. He knew it was a big deal, but he was just excited. It was fun for him. That's the vibe you get from the letter. It was just fun. But now he was about to be drafted into the no fun league and his transition wouldn't be the best. But the night before he got drafted, Vince Young would have fun one last time. The dreams he dreamt while sitting in the old oak tree, the one outside of his childhood home, those dreams weren't about what was now gonna happen the next day when he was drafted. Those dreams actually weren't about football at all. They were about Vince and his family existing happily, safe and together in a better environment. So now Vince and his family are in Manhattan. The NFL draft is just a day away. And these Southerners are having the time of their life just enjoying everything they're seeing. Then it starts snowing and they can't believe their eyes. If you happen to be unaware, it don't snow much down here in Texas. So the first time you experience a beautiful snowy night and y'all all together is one of them things that can feel overwhelming. Vince told a limo driver to pull over at Central Park and his family ran around and played like kids in the snow. Snow angels, snowballs, the whole nine yards. This was Vince's dream. It was now a reality. The next day, Vince was drafted to his hometown team, or the team that used to be his hometown team. The Houston Oilers were now the Tennessee Titans, and while a lot had changed with the organization, one thing remained the same. Vince's pops, Steve McNair, was still the team's starting quarterback, a position he'd held since Vince was 12, and he wanted Vince Young to be his heir apparent. Tennessee, however, favored Matt Leinart initially, but swayed their opinion at some point and decided to go ahead and go with Vince Young due to the fact that his ceiling was much higher. Now, I've given the Titans credit for having some of the greatest generational running backs that I've ever seen, but when it comes to quarterbacks, they've mismanaged their share, including Marcus Mariota, who I just did a video on. This also includes their most legendary QB, 
Steve McNair, and by proxy, Vince Young. I've made it a point throughout this video to illustrate to you just how close Steve and Vince truly were. The Titans obviously knew about this relationship, and it was publicly reported that Steve hoped they'd take Vince. It was also reported that the Titans were worried about Vince's transition into the league. Was he ready? Was he mature enough? You know what could sure that up? Hmm, maybe a veteran QB to mentor him? Maybe the one who he's always looked up to, who he happens to have developed a father-son relationship with? It seems like a no-brainer move to keep that guy around for at least the first one or two years of Vince's career. This will help to ensure that your third overall pick transitions well into the league and that investment bears fruit. But what do the Titans do? Not only do they trade McNair, not only do they trade him to one of their biggest rivals at the damn time, but they did it before Vince took his first practice snap and they did it in the ugliest, most disrespectful way possible. The Titans wanted Steve McNair to restructure his contract and told him that if he didn't, he wouldn't be allowed to work out at the facility. Now, they didn't give him a call and try to work this out in advance. These people waited till he came to the facility and didn't have a team owner, didn't have a head coach. They had a damn trainer to go up to this man and tell him that he would not be allowed to work out there. And mind you, this is after 10 years of being the starting quarterback. Imagine being treated like that after a decade on your job. So they force him out in the ugliest way possible, then turn around and draft his son. It's not only one of the most disrespectful moves I've seen, it's one of the dumbest moves I've seen, considering the fact that your top three pick needs that guy. It would have obviously given Vince Young the best chance to be successful, but that organization loves to cripple their quarterbacks. Certain members of Vince's family who were once overjoyed at his success now wanted to use it as a fix-all for their lives. Hands reached out, bro, over and over, pressuring Vince to give them more and more. Agents and financial advisors took advantage of the man, taking way more than their fair share. Then the media piled on. Vince Young wasn't this. Vince Young wasn't that. He couldn't live up to the hype. The fun game he had played to escape from his real life now had become his real life and it changed his perspective. When you take away the fun, the only thing left is the pressure. And all of a sudden, all he could think about was the stress. Although his mentor was shipped out of town, before Vince could ever step foot in the building, Steve McNair was still just a phone call away, which Vince called a blessing and his saving grace early on. Imagine how much bigger of a blessing he could have been if the Titans actually allowed him to stay in the building. It's crazy because Vince still didn't have his father figure in the house, but at least this time he could get him on the phone. But in 2009, the league lost a player. The world lost an idol, and Vince Young lost a dad. The loss hit Vince harder than most of us could ever know. And in part two, I want to really dig into that. In that video, we'll discuss Vince's NFL career, both before and after Steve McNair's passing. We'll talk about his short time spent in the CFL and his roller coaster life after football. How he went from middle school brawls to Houston bar fights and from being held in handcuffs to DUI arrest. So look out for part two. It'll come out next week. Until then, check out these recent videos on former Titans players.